gracious God, we give thanks to you for this day, for our lives, the gift of life, the chance to come together this morning and think about these things. Pray to be inspired, to learn, to be shaped according to your wisdom. And Lord, if there's the need for bright lights in our own moment of church history, please help us to be faithful, even being willing to be faithful nobodies who just keep things moving forward and keep things faithful. Pray for your help and grace in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, um, last time we were beginning to talk about how we're focusing on the Western tradition of the church after the fall of the Western Roman Empire. That, that ring a bell? You know, <laughs> the Western Roman Empire you know, has its last emperor at the end of the 400s, and then we have this sort of chaotic period in Western Europe for a while, uh, where there's going to be a power vacuum that's eventually filled by the Bishop of Rome, the Pope himself, and he will establish eventually the Holy Roman Empire by 800 when Charlemagne, the King of the Franks, is crowned Holy Roman Emperor. Well, today we're going to kind of go back to focusing on that Western Church tradition. So we're talking about the Latin Roman Catholic Church in the Middle Ages. The Middle Ages really begin in that 5th century through about the 15th or 16th century. So it's this thousand year period um, kind of between the fall of Rome in the West and the Reformation. So the early part of that uh, Middle Age period is sometimes called the Dark Ages uh, because of its political turmoil and chaos. Um, But we're going to see there's still lots of good things and bright lights that happen during that time, okay? But I mentioned this last time I was going to begin with the rise of Islam. Um, Now, this mainly is going to affect the Eastern Church, which is on that side of the Mediterranean where Islam emerges, right, where it's born. Uh, But eventually, it's going to try to make its its way into Europe through North Africa. This is when you might want to look at your map there for a second. You're going to see there's kind of a route from the Middle East through, down through Egypt, and they, the uh, Muslim warriors will conquer most of North Africa and eventually try to work their way up into Spain through the Iberian Peninsula, and uh, that's where they are stopped by the Franks, which is another one of the things that shows the, the Frankish power, um, and it's going to make them a, uh, the, the most understandable ally for the Bishop of Rome. For him to reach out to them as the one to establish this new Holy Roman Empire. So stopping the Muslim advance into Europe is one of the things that shows that the Franks have now become powerful enough to be this political ally, authority, you know, for the next phase of history. Um, But you you may know, I don't know how much you know about the uh, Islam's origins. Of course, Muhammad lives in the 600s. So just as you're tracking Islam as a religion is about 600 years younger than Christianity. And, of course, Muhammad's story, we could spend the whole time talking about that, you know, and him uh, receiving or dictating, as, as the claim goes, the uh, Quran. And then there are certain holy cities associated with it. If you've ever studied some of the Quran, you will find that there are some characters from the Hebrew Bible in there. Uh, Jesus, of course, is a character in the story and you can find some similarities between the story scripture tells and the story the Quran tells but of course it's one of those situations where the differences make all the difference so comparative uh, religionists will try to emphasize the similarities but people who practice the two religions would emphasize the difference the differences Um, so you know Jesus is regarded as a prophet but not as someone who was crucified certainly not a son of God that's that idea itself is offensive um, to Islam but one thing to note is that it's, it's more or less a warrior religion from the beginning. That is to say, they, it is birthed in the atmosphere of war. Muhammad himself is a warrior, and it begins to advance itself in the midst of a lot of kind of political upheaval and turmoil in the, what we would call the Middle East. We usually refer to it as the ancient Near East. And they will become pretty powerful really quick and be able to take over the whole ancient Persian Empire to the east and then we'll turn their sights to the west and we'll conquer many parts of the former, of the Byzantine Empire, of the Eastern Roman Empire, remember? 
as I said, they'll take all that land from North Africa, uh, moving over to, up into Spain, but finally stopped, which checks the, the balance of power for a little bit. Uh, but it's going, to be a, it's going to be the beginning of military, political, and religious tensions between Christians and Muslims for a long time. You, know, you have to understand that that happens so you understand these happening. Islam emerges, it's spreading, it's conquering formerly Christian lands in the east. This one isn't necessarily useful, but it, it shows you kind of the division between the eastern and western empires. And so you should imagine Islam emerges over here in the east. And it's going to, like I said, conquer eastward the Persian Empire. And then it's going to move down. This is out near Alexandria, Egypt, all across North Africa, and then try to come up into Spain. But that's where they're stopped. Okay. Uh, that's what the, the famous battle there is sometimes called the Battle of Tours or the Battle of Poitiers. If you studied these things before. So it's a significant moment in just Western history. All right, so uh, we talked about, so if the Franks are the ones that stopped them, they're going to be the natural ally for the Pope in Rome. So uh, the Pope crowns Charlemagne as the Holy Roman Emperor in the year 800 on Christmas Day, establishing this new entity that unites Western Europe. Got that? All right, it's going to also give birth to uh, a renaissance, a little period of of Renaissance, where there's sort of, uh, you know, in periods of turmoil and political instability, you don't have a whole lot of art, music, literature, philosophy, and things like that going on. You need peace for that stuff, right? And typically in history, when you have a time of peace, you'll start to see uh, flourishing in the arts, you know, more literature, philosophy, leisurely activities, you know. And so you have some of that during the reign of Charles the Great. Uh, this word Carolingian is just a reference to Charles the Great, also known as Charlemagne. Um, uh, so like Carol's the, like a feminized version of Charles. There's a King Charles now, right? <laughs> uh, so that Renaissance is always good. During these periods of Renaissance, oftentimes there's a rediscovery of uh, classic literature, ancient Greek and Roman text, um, including the philosophical text. You're going to see... Aristotle is going to reemerge for the West, who had kind of been lost um, for a few centuries, and that's important for theology's history. But let's keep moving forward. Um, in terms of the Western Church's spiritual condition during this time, it's very much in need of reform. Uh, the popes and the bishops, for too long, now for several generations, have had to play the role of political leader, oftentimes military leaders. Um, they're very much involved in matters of state. As a result, there's not a whole lot of matters of faith <laughs> going on in some of those contexts. Remember last time we talked about the monastics providing this sort of bright light of where things are preserved and where you find pure expressions of Christianity. That continues to be the case as we get into the high Middle Ages, which are the middle middle ages, right? <laughs> That's why we call them the high middle, which is like early middle Middle, middle. It's the high middle ages and late middle ages. So where does the spiritual reform come from during this time? This is what I want to talk about next. If you're okay for us moving forward into the next subject. The, there are some popes who contribute positively to the spiritual reform of the church in, during this period. Um, I mentioned two of them in the notes there. Leo the Ninth. One of the problems you had... Um, was sexual morality, frankly, among leaders, um, bishops and popes and stuff in the church. Someone like Leo tries to crack down on that. And um, in periods of kind of turmoil, you, sometimes you, you, know, you have to be pretty strict. And so he is the first pope to establish clerical celibacy as a requirement. All right? So it wasn't always required for priests, bishops, and the like to be unmarried, celibate folks, but in this case, he requires it. In some ways, I think I've said this before, you know, when people are in sort of chaos, and the same rule applies in terms of ethics, when people are immature, you need more rules, 
You know, that's why you need more classroom rules for your pre-K and your kindergarten. And when I get to my college level classes, I usually don't have to tell people, you know, respect your neighbor. You know, if someone's speaking, don't interrupt, you know, or things like that. I can generally assume they know how to do this stuff. But the folks are like, all right, things are in disarray. Everything's bad. Strict rule. Can't be married and must be committed to celibacy as a priest. Um, unfortunately, uh, Pope Leo is not able to do much more than that because he dies. But right as he dies, something really significant happens in the history of the church. <laughs> he had sent one of his uh, kind of uh, emissaries, an ambassador, like a, it's called a legate, to the eastern bishops in Constantinople to try to work some things out between them because tensions have been rising for a few centuries between the east and the west. Uh, things go bad during that meeting, such that on the altar of the Hagia Sophia, anybody been there in Istanbul, you know, to this big, beautiful, it was a cathedral church. Of course, now it's a mosque, you know, but in those days it was a cathedral church. And um, Pope, uh, Pope Leo's legate writes a letter of excommunication for the Bishop of Constantinople saying you are outside the church. The Pope kicks you outside the church. Now, in some ways, he doesn't even really have the authority to do this because the Pope had just died. You know, so he's acting in his name abroad. Uh, I'm trying to help you see Pope Leo doesn't do this. It's his you know, emissary who does it, but he can't stop it because he's just died. And they haven't chosen a new one yet. Well, after he excommunicates the Bishop of Constantinople, Constantinople returns the favor. And says, well, we say you guys are out. And this leads to what we call the Great Schism of 1054. It's the official split between the Eastern and Western churches. Such that after 1054, we rightly refer to the Western church as Roman Catholic. And we rightly refer to the Eastern church as Eastern Orthodox. Okay. Before then, remember, you could use those words Orthodox and Catholic synonymously, you know, interchangeably. That's the name they take after that point. Now remember this division though, it's been sort of happening at the cultural level at the liturgical level uh, for uh, several centuries because you have the Greek East has its own peculiar cultures and the Latin West has its own peculiar aspects of culture. You know? uh, it just becomes formalized at this point. In case that is really discouraging I mean in some ways you think, wow the church made it a thousand years before there was a real official split that seems maybe encouraging. And even after this, they, there were efforts at reconciliation between the Eastern and Western bishops, but it never, uh, it never took. And so they're still officially split to this day. There still are efforts at reunification, but now the, the division is so well ingrained in the churches and the, <laughs> the societies they're connected with. That's like a thousand years of history and law and all that stuff that has to be undone and untangled for the two groups to officially come back together. Pope John Paul II, I think, took communion with the Eastern Orthodox Metropolitan, is what they, they call him, as a sign of unity, you know, and they're, they're trying to do other things like that. They met and prayed together, like Pope Francis and the current one um, in Istanbul, or have gotten together in Jerusalem and prayed together, you know, and then they're actually planning a a new council of Nicaea. Well, it's, it's not exactly going to be a council, but it's a commemorative event that brings together the East and the West that's supposed to happen in the next 10 years or so. What do you think about this? <laughs> so is it a difference in culture, or is it um, that they don't definitely contribute that. together monetarily for, like, missionary efforts, uh, or what the difference between them? Are there, are there differences in what they actually believe? So the, the cultural differences are definitely there. Um, it's also like who has authority to decide dis disputes or determine doctrine. In the Eastern churches, they still hold that it's a collegial thing. It's like the bishops acting together. So it's, it's what we would call conciliar. By con conciliar, I mean they, they think a church council is what's ultimately authoritative, and that's a gathering of all the bishops. In the Western church, the... Bishop of Rome has been increasing in power now for several centuries by the time you get here, and he claims absolute authority over the church, and even authority over councils. 
So the Eastern bishops say, that's not cool. You can't do that. You know, if you want to claim to be the king of your own kingdom, you can go do that by yourself. You know, over here, we're going to keep the one true Catholic church going. <laughs> that's, and that's really how Eastern Orthodox think of themselves. They say, we are the true one holy Catholic church. The Romans left us. It's their, it's their fault. You know, and then the Protestants came off from them, so they don't know what to think about us. You know, but like if you were an Eastern Orthodox person and you were charting out church history, you would say there was Christ, the apostles, us, then the Roman church broke off. And we just kept going, you know, preserving things. And then the Protestants broke off of them, you know, but we're, we're, we're keeping it going. Uh, so a lot of it is church authority, like who has the church authority. Now what's interesting, interesting is that Eastern Orthodoxy also has its version of denominations. You know, but usually they're rooted in whatever their country of origin was. Like, where did it emerge? Where did those immigrants come from when they came to the U.S. and established their own little movement? But generally speaking, they're still united to the larger Eastern movement. What unites them? Now, both Eastern and Western Christians affirm the Nicene Creed. Right? The Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, and the Athanasian Creed. That's why we call those ecumenical creeds. Because they're believed by everyone. But you, perhaps you know the dispute between the East and West related to the Nicene Creed. Anyone? From God. From yeah, you're on the right track. So the Western Church in about the 7th century added a phrase to the Nicene Creed. And it's the phrase, and the Son. This is called the filioque controversy. Some people regard this as the straw that broke the camel's back, you know, between the tensions between the two churches. Uh, this is just a Latin word for and the sun. So think about the Nicene Creed if you know it. If you need to pull it up on your phone or something, you can't. It's the one that's like, we believe in God the Father Almighty. Uh, then we believe in Jesus Christ. That's, when it, that's the one that says God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made. But the article on the Holy Spirit says, we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father, and with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. All right, so it's got a full <clears throat> doctrine of the Holy Spirit. The Western Church added a line in there. They made it say, we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, and with the Father and Son is worshipped and glorified. Now, at first blush, that might seem insignificant. It's like, well, you can find scripture passages that seem to support that. Jesus talking about sending them another helper. You know, um, surely Jesus is in some way the source of this thing. In many ways, the Western church does this because of uh, St. Augustine's influence theologically, who conceived of the Trinity, the doctrine of the Trinity, with this lover model. Uh, and in the lover model, it says the Father is the lover, the Son is the beloved, and the Holy Spirit is the love between them. So the Holy Spirit emerges from the Father and Son as a personal reality. So it's lover, love, beloved, and the love between them. But, of course, Augustine doesn't understand this love just as a force, but as a, a real person. So it's just Augustine's way of kind of making sense of it. So the Western Church wants to say... The Spirit doesn't just proceed from the Father, but from the love union of the Father and Son together. And so they put the line in. Now, some Eastern theologians tried to argue against it theologically. They had different ways of conceiving the Trinity um, that were complementary. But more than anything, the problem is you don't get to change an ecumenical creed that's decided upon by the whole church, East and West, gathered together in two major councils, Nicaea and Constantinople, remember? And so it's that unilateral move by the Bishop of Rome to say, I can amend an ecumenical creed to make it say what we want it to say. You know? And so it's more like the Eastern bishops are saying, you have no right to do that. You know? You're not better than us. You know? <laughs> they could even claim to be older than the Bishop of Rome. We got the Bishop of Jerusalem has been there um, for a long time, Antioch, Alexandria. So does this make sense? This unilateral move is just, it's like the Pope asserting himself against, over against the other bishops. And so that's going to be one of those final straws. 
like I said, 1054. <laughs> okay, let's keep going real quick. Um, after Pope Leo, the next important pope is Pope uh, Gregory VII, as you see there. Um, he also tries to reform uh, the church in some ways. He's the, the one and only pope to excommunicate the Holy Roman Emperor, <laughs> Henry IV. He's the emperor he, he, he thinks has acted with injustice and righteousness, that he's immoral, and so he actually excommunicates him from the church, which creates, as you can imagine, this sort of power dynamic that's going to go back and forth for a few centuries between the Pope and the Holy Roman Emperor. Who's really in charge, right? Who's, and if the Pope can excommunicate the Emperor, that seems to be he has access to a, a kind of power that the Emperor doesn't. Some Emperors are going to be bitter about that, despise that. And so you're going to have conflicts between them for a while. Um, Gregory also, he does away with the practice of investiture. Investiture was the idea that an emperor or king or some local sovereign would pick who the bishops were in a, in a local area. And so the pope is saying, you don't get to pick your local bishops. He's saying, that's, that's spiritual work, it's my job, it's not your job. You know? in the, for understandable reasons, I mean, emperors, local kings or rulers would just pick their friends you know, to be the bishop. That person might not even be a Christian, you know, but it, like gen, genuinely in their hearts, everybody's baptized Christian at this point um, in the Holy Roman Empire, but <laughs> they're just picking their friends. So he tries to bring reform through those two things. We're going to see it doesn't, it doesn't fully help. Let's talk about another thing that does help, monasticism. There's the emergence of three new uh, orders of monastics during the high Middle Ages that go a long way to creating spiritual reform. They actually create sort of the context for which gr uh, greater spiritual reform can happen later because it's a, it's a little community that's separated kind of from the affairs of state where people could genuinely study scripture, pray, commit their lives to following the way of Jesus. And I think I mentioned last time that oftentimes these monastic communities would be in conflict with the bishops uh, because the bishops are attending to affairs of state and are often fairly wealthy, whereas monastics, by definition, make vows of poverty. Right? So they're, just their existence rebukes uh, the bishops many times. So three of the most important, the Cistercians, which begin in the 10th and 11th century. Uh, Bernard of Clairvaux is associated with them. You may have heard his name before. He's a theologian of the High Middle Ages. They're called Cistercian just based on the city in France where they... Or emerge. Uh, even more important than them in terms of their lasting significance and broad appeal are going to be Franciscans and Dominicans. Let me go back for a second. What makes the Cistercians distinct? Um, remember last time we talked about St. Benedict, St. Benedict's rule, which establishes the order of life for all monastic communities thereafter. Um, the Cistercians felt that too many Benedictines had become lax in their commitment. And so Bernard and these Cistercians basically come back with a way of saying we're going to be more fully devoted, you know, and be sort of more strict about keeping uh, the rule of St. Benedict and such. So it's just kind of a stricter sect or expression. They would, have, they would have articulated that not as strict, but as more committed. Then next is the Franciscans and the Dominicans, which emerged in the 12th and 13th. You've probably heard of these, right? Franciscans are sometimes called the Grey Friars. Named after St. Francis of Assisi. You know his story? He's a young man born into great wealth who uh, one day is confronted with a gospel message about, he hears a reading where Jesus says to the rich man, go and sell everything you have and give to the poor and come and follow me. And he understands it as Jesus calling him to do that. And so he goes, sells all that he has, gives the poor to the chagrin of his father and, go, <laughs> and goes and uh, becomes a monastic and eventually will start this whole new order, which is known for its poverty, its service of the poor. Um, in fact, these are called mendicant orders. Do you know that word, mendicant? Which is a reference to their poverty vows. They're beggars. Mendicant means like a beggar. They also don't stay in 
the monastery. Both these groups, Franciscans, are out in their communities um, serving the poor. Yeah, they have places where they live and stay, but they're mostly, like, they're visible to people, not hidden away. They, you know, Franciscans are known for care of animals and basically just this whole sort of gentle approach to the world, to creation care, all of that. So it means St. Like Francis is patron saint for animals, yeah, and uh, just kind of the earth, care of the earth, you know, that kind of thing. Um, there's, a, there's a story in Francis's life where eventually the, the bishop of Rome prostrates themselves in front of Francis. He had sort of a hard time getting his order recognized initially by the Pope, but eventually it sort of wins over enough people that the Pope himself is willing to acknowledge sort of his spiritual greatness and lays on the floor in front of St. Francis in one of these moments to kind of demonstrate that. If only that could have characterized the, uh, the attitude of Popes thereafter, but it does not. Okay. Now let's talk about the Dominicans. The Dominicans are started by St. Dominic of Guzman. They're sometimes called Black Friars because of what they wear. So, like, you can tell it's a Franciscan because they wear a, a gray habit, like uh, their robe. Basically. And the Dominicans wear a black one, so it sort of distinguishes them. This is the order of preachers. If you ever see an author's name and at the, at the end it has comma OP, that means they're a Dominican. Uh, OP is order of preachers, all right? So they, like the Franciscans, also make vows of poverty. They're beggars, but they are the ones who become teachers, theologians, scholastics later on. And they are also out of the monastery, out among the community. They will become some of your first university professors, Dominicans. Right? Even to this day, the Dominicans are known for being great teachers at the universities, there are tons of Dominican universities in the world. Uh, if you ever come across one called Thomas Aquinas College or whatever, there's a tons of <laughs> Thomas Aquinas academies and colleges. These are connected to uh, the most famous Dominican uh, in history, which, which is Thomas Aquinas, who I'll talk about more in just a moment. So one of the things you see with these monastic movements is they, are, they see that there's sort of a spiritual problem with the church, that it's impoverished in some way, or not faithful, not genuine, and they're trying to be a faithful, genuine expression of it. The way we might see it is they're be, they're maybe they seem like extreme. You know, to take a monastic vow seems really extreme you know, uh, to us, but in their, the context in which they're living, where it seems like the church is fully corrupt, you can kind of understand why people might run the opposite direction if they want to be the real thing. And it's good. It really sustains the life of the church during those ages. And like I said, many of the reformers are going to come out of these monastic groups, including Protestant reformers, eventually. One of the things I'm hoping to do by talking about them, like today in last class, is maybe reintroduce monasticism to you. Or maybe reframe the way you might have thought about it in the past. You know, um, being part of the Protestant Reformation stream, which does not continue monastic communities in the same way they had existed beforehand, in part because of Luther's own monastic experience, which he thought was not healthy for him, psychologically or spiritually. Protestants have tended to think as monastics as sort of weird, unnecessary, you know, unusual, and like there's no need for that, and just live a faithful Christian life wherever you are, you know. Um, and get married, you know, <laughs> you know things like that. Uh, you know, in Protestant churches, we the idea of a chosen, unmarried life that would be given a hundred percent to service to Christ still seems somewhat unusual. I think in Protestant circles, we can almost we tend to treat unmarried people like they're half people, like they need to get got to set them up with somebody, you know. But <laughs> the, all that actually goes back to Martin Luther's. Uh, affirmation of marriage as a good thing. I mean, he was a matchmaker. Uh, I'm skipping ahead a thousand years, but Luther becomes a matchmaker between former monks and nuns. He like hooks them up with each other. And he himself ends up, he, he like rescues a bunch of nuns out of in herring barrels from a, from a convent, 
brings them to Wittenberg and like matches them up with all of his former you know, monk buddies. And he himself ends up marrying one of them. So like the Protestant tradition has sort of kept that kind of idea going. You know? <laughs> but these guys are really sustaining the life of the church during that time. Okay, so if these are good examples, let's go to a bad example. All right. <laughs> if, if the Western church is in need of spiritual reform, popes are sometimes contributing positively, monastics are contributing positively, this does not help. All right, it really does not help. So let's talk a little more about um, the Crusades. It's one of those things that, Lots of people know something about, right? You've at least heard of them. Um, and then you get sometimes debates about whether they were good or bad. Uh, let's talk about what's going on. There's many different causes for the Crusades. You can't, um, people oversimplify them sometimes, usually to make them be all good or all bad, all right? That's oversimplifying the case. There are religious causes, economic and political causes. The presenting cause for the first crusade in 1095 is to recover the quote-unquote holy land, that is Jerusalem and surrounding areas, from the Muslims who've taken over that region. And so the Pope Urban famously says, Deus vult, which means God wills it, and calls a bunch of people together, sends them on a crusade to, to battle. To win over that and promises a plenary uh, indulgence. Yeah, sorry, I lost the word there. A plenary indulgence, which is a like promise of full forgiveness of all your sins if you die as a crusader, which might motivate some people to go fight in the crusades, right? <laughs> if I go and die in the crusades, I can know all my sins are forgiven, the Pope says. A plenary indulgence. A plenary means like complete or full. And the indulgences were ways you could sort of purchase forgiveness either for yourself or relatives um, or maybe limit time in purgatory, things like that. But a plenary indulgence for all crusaders. Okay, so maybe that motivates some people. But the next point is important to remember too. Uh, this is the, the era of the feudal system. You remember studying this in world history? And various lords of the manors, you know, <laughs> uh, feudal lords had their own knights they had their own warriors who are trained and raised up for protection of their land. But often, if it's a time of peace, you have a bunch of people trained for war who aren't getting to fight. You know, uh, who are a little antsy to use their skills in battle. And so, the crusade provides an opportunity to do that. But instead of just fighting off some robber from the land, you can go fight real enemies of God in Jerusalem. Um, for, a, for a, this seemingly noble purpose, right? Well, the first crusade, it actually works. It's successful in that they do take over the Holy Land. They do push Muslims out, slaughtering many in the process and many Jews who lived you know, in Jerusalem at the time. One of the things you find when you study the history of the crusades is that the crusaders' passions were in this, like their... Like, bloodlust was indiscriminate. Um, sometimes they killed other Christians. Uh, they were certainly killing Palestinian Christians that lived in Jerusalem already. Jews, Muslims, even each other sometimes. <laughs> it's like, the, the knight was not necessarily a noble person. Um, and there are plenty of accounts of that. So, the, the problem is this doesn't last. It's not stable. You know, they, it's like they've conquered the land, but they haven't set up a system by which you know Christians can thrive or flourish in the Holy Land at this point. And so Muslims keep fighting back. And so they keep having to send more people. So you get a second one and then a third one. All with this same kind of goal. And you got people traveling far and wide. I mean these things like propaganda about the Crusades are spreading all over the place. People you know kind of get hype about it and would travel long distances. Especially people who are poor uh, kind of down on their luck, you know, now they got a cause to live for, something bigger than themselves to join. So it gets amazing involvement in terms of people willing to go. It climaxes in the, what's the Fourth Crusade. Now, there are historians who spend their whole lives just studying about the Fourth Crusade. Have you heard of this one before? Does anybody know why it's especially tragic? 
That's right. <laughs> right. So the Crusaders are heading from the west into the east, right? Uh, they get uh, sort of parlayed. They kind of get distracted and redirected, and they end up in Constantinople. Constantinople, which is, of course, the capital city of the Byzantine Empire. It was founded to be a Christian city. It was in every respect, you know, visually a Christian city. But the Crusaders from the west want to fight somebody. And so they start sacking Constantinople, destroying churches, artwork, killing Eastern bishops and clergy. And so it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's like a, not even a civil war because it's just one-sided. But the Western Crusaders wipe out a Christian city. And all the people they are killing are Christians. Okay. So if you think, when you think about the Crusades, this is not just Christian warriors versus Muslim warriors. It actually climaxes in... Just Christians killing other Christians, or professing Christians. Uh, just one of many reasons why this is a tragic history. Now, there are so many books written about the Crusades. You can spend, like, like I said, a long time studying these. There's no way we can cover it all right now. I'm just trying to give you a quick, brief overview. Assessment of their lasting endurance you know, throughout history is it's mostly negative. Uh, there are people, there are apologists for the Crusades, you know, who try to um, highlight some redeeming aspect of them. Um, there's a Muslim scholar at Barry who talks about, from the Muslim perspective, what's the lasting legacy of the Crusades? They're hardly mentioned. You know, <laughs> it's, just, it's just a blip on their history of war, basically. One of the reasons I think it's it makes more of an impact on Western history and especially history of Christianity is because people recognize that it's contrary to the character of Christianity for this to have happened. And so it becomes this big moment of the church. It's like worldly passions compromising the message and meaning of what it means to be the church and causing the church to look its worst, to be its worst. Any thoughts or questions about this? Is there a perspective Oh, uh, yes, uh, there, <laughs> there is, especially on this one, as you can imagine. You know, in, some, in some ways, this is what prevents Eastern and Western churches being reunited. Because as you know, in many parts of the world, especially in traditional societies, memory is long. Right? And it's like something that happened is not just something you did to me. It, it could have been our ancestors from a thousand years ago did something to each other, but they see it as you did to me. You know, or I did to you. That's why it's so hard to get, you know, East Middle Eastern peace and such. You know, it's not just let's move forward for the sake of our children. It's you know, your dad and granddad did this to my <laughs> and granddad. It's a tough moment. Thankfully, not the end of the story. All right. Anybody else want to comment or question? I just I'm curious. What who are like the more outlying voices of opposition for the Christians during the time of the Crusades? Just because. I, when I was in school, my teachers yeah. used to use the Crusades as an example to show that Christians are still bad and that yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> we need to feel bad for ourselves oh, yeah. and not be so self-righteous. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> well, let's just say this is just what's going on like in terms of military, political history. you know, yeah. And that's often who writes the history books, right? Mm -hmm. People who win political, military. You don't know about the unnamed, sort of unknown faithful countless ones that are preserving a purity to the church. That's what's happening in these but these have this is concurrent. Like the Franciscans and Dominicans are rapidly spreading at the same time others are going to war. And if, even just studying the history of monasticism, it's almost unbelievable how fast monasteries spread. Especially once again, we think it's weird, we can't imagine the appeal. You have like dozens starting every couple months all throughout Europe. So there is this underlying movement of, we would say, Christian faithfulness that's radically opposed to what's going on at the level of the state. Okay, so you could point to like an internal opposition, but the Definitely. contrary side isn't aggressive versus... Yeah, yeah. that's right. And that's the, another aspect of the story is that these folks, they don't take up arms. <coughs> you know, they kind of reflect a 
of meekness to them, and as a result are usually killed uh, by bishops or other church leaders who have some, some level of political or military authority. And I think I said last time, when we, when we talk about the uh, Inquisition, that's not aimed at pagan unbelievers, it's aimed at Christians. You know, it's like those in authority at those under them to try to uh, see if they're really faithful, if they're really believing the truth, you know, as defined by the Pope and stuff. And so they often are going after abbots, you know, an abbot's like the leader of a monastery. You know, you're going to get inquisitors showing up at the monastery to take the abbot uh, away and drill him, torture him, you know, something like that. It's tough, tough stuff. Right? Yeah. What did Jerusalem look like at the end of the Crusades? I mean, what was changed about that? And what went forward? Um, well, I should say there are more after the fourth one, but they're lesser known, sort of lesser significant. I mean, it looks in some ways similar to the way it does today. You know, it's always been this, yeah, hodgepodge of varying groups, you know. It's like you don't just have Christians, Jews, and Muslims in Jerusalem, which you do, which is already unique, right, <laughs> in terms of cities of the world. You got all the different types of Christians, Muslims, and, <laughs> and Jews, you know, all their various sects and denominations. You know, you've been... There in Jerusalem, you see, you know, well, here's where the Armenian Orthodox do their thing. This is where the Eastern Orthodox do. This is where the Roman Catholics do their thing. So, yeah, you got <laughs> yeah, Catholics there. Yeah. Till now, realize where they were, where this all. Yeah. Came. And because it's a holy land for all three religions, one of the ways you can see that the Christian, in here, scare quotes, mission to the holy land, the holy land is not successful, is in the fact that. The Dome of the Rock still stands on the Temple Mount, you know. So in that sense, you know, the Muslims control that. Um, let's, let's talk about some more positive things um, <laughs> before our class ends. You know, uh, the Spanish Reconquista is, I mean, somewhat positive. It's because of this conflict between Christians and Muslims, the Spanish Reconquista is seeking to push Islam out of Spain so that it's pushed out of Europe. People see it as this, you know, really big potential problem for Christianity, for Christendom, I should say, because of the way it's already conquered much of Eastern Christendom's lands. The, you know, everywhere you have warriors doing stuff, you also have people who don't care to be warriors, but, you know, are still on either side who, like, relate to each other. Um, and some of the people that relate to each other, once Christians and Muslims are in the same places are ph philosophers and theologians. Uh, I mean, Muslim theologians, you know, they, they have those too. And many Muslim theologians had for a while been reading the works of Aristotle, especially like his ethics and metaphysics and such, works that had been largely lost to the Latin-speaking West. Uh, because Islam emerges in the East, there's, the scholars of the East are Greek-speaking, and so they can read Greek scholarly works like Plato and Aristotle. Now, Plato had such an influence on Augustine that he's the main Greek philosopher read in the West. Aristotle had been the main Greek philosopher read uh, in the Eastern portions. Now, it's important that the West sort of rediscovers Aristotle because he will become an important conversation partner uh, for medieval Christian theologians, especially Thomas Aquinas. But Thomas Aquinas essentially Christianizes Aristotle's work. Uh, that's called Thomism, named after him. And by Christianize it, I don't mean he just accepts it wholesale. Thomas Aquinas writes commentaries on books of the Bible, and he writes commentaries on Aristotle's works. And he refers to him simply as the philosopher. And they found many things useful in Aristotle's ethics that could be, you know, sort of reframed. Um, as you know, within Christianity, many of his categories. I mean, I don't know if you know if you know much about Aristotle, but he's definitely one of the smartest people who ever lived. Um, he was polymathic. You know, like he had deep understanding of multiple fields of inquiry. Many of his writings continue to shape how everyone thinks about it. Everything. You know, <laughs> he's he's one of those rare individuals, and uh, just like Augustine related to Plato. 
Thomas Aquinas relates to Aristotle in a way that he says we can sort of plunder the Egyptians here, by which they meant, you know, Israel, ancient Israel took the wealth and knowledge and good things out of Egypt, leaving all the bad stuff behind in their exodus. He's saying, we can do the same thing. Take all the good stuff that's found here. Uh, contemplate how it might um, help us understand God or think about God. In many ways, it's the logic of Aristotle that Aquinas will employ for making theological arguments. That's what's really helpful. So uh, we could say much more about that. Sorry if you don't care about that, and that's boring. but Because um, that's more like theological history. But it's still important. All right, the rise of universities. These two things are connected. The first universities emerge in the 11th and 12th centuries. Some of the earliest ones I've listed there for you. Uh, In Italy, uh, Oxford. Oxford is older than Cambridge, just barely, you know, like like 50 years or something. But an Oxford person would never let a Cambridge person forget that. (laughs) Even though both both universities are like 1,000 years old. I don't know if you know there's like this Oxford-Cambridge stuff where they don't even recognize each other's degrees. Like, it's just this, this kind of <laughs> tension, you know, between them. You know, one, they think they're better than each other. Spain and France. Before this, all education is either private, like private tutors, or you might get it through um, monastic communities providing some level of education. That's certainly where a person could get an education is within monastic communities. But now it's being offered to the broader public. And you have what you... What you think of as a college degree, like a bachelor's of, a bachelor of arts in whatever subject, those begin to emerge during this, during this time. So it's more formalized. Makes sense? Um, and during that time, some of the bright lights for Christianity are these folks. So Anselm, who's a, a great philosopher, theologian. Don't have time to talk much about him. Let's talk about... Peter Abelard, who writes one of the first significant theological texts that would be used in a classroom setting. His book is called uh, Seek et Non, which means yes and no in Latin. And (laughs) actually, it's a collection of writings of early church fathers on various topics uh, where they disagree. So it's like, you know, Augustine says this, so-and-so says this. Tertullian said this, so-and-so said this. And it's just like a collection of primary sources that would be used. And uh, this kind of arrangement creates medieval... Uh, the medieval educational method is called scholasticism because it's very... Uh, it's very like um, airtight logic. It's, it's driven by a kind of airtight logic. And if you have two opinions that disagree... The scholastic is going to treat this like a dialectic, not like an argument. And a dialectic means we're, this is like, these are two steps on the way to understanding the truth of the matter. And the scholastic wants to understand the truth of the matter, so they engage in dialectic rather than argument. They think argument is sophistry. So that's where you're just trying to win. And it's like we want to actually know the truth. And so we take the perspectives and try to go one step closer with our arguments to arrive at the truth. But when you arrive at that place of truth, it's usually some highly detailed (laughs) argument. So if you read medieval scholastic theologians, it can feel mind-numbing because they are so careful with every line. It's intentional. It's responding to somebody else. And so when you read Thomas Aquinas' Summa Theologia, it's like one of the most brilliant things ever written, but it's hard to read. All right. Hard to read. Uh, Good stuff. So then Peter Lombard has this book called The Sentences. That's the standard theological textbook for like 500 years. <laughs> and it's also a collection of early church writings on various topics. Uh, I mentioned Bonaventure, who's probably the most renowned Franciscan theologian. Thomas Aquinas is really the high point of all medieval theology. Um, it's hard. He is like Augustine in that it's hard to overstate his importance. Thomas Aquinas is actually also a really enjoyable person to study. Like, he has a sweetness about him. He never attacks anyone in writing. He always assumes that the people who came before him had something right to say, and so he tries to incorporate them into his system. He was known for being a large man, a quiet man, so they called him the dumb ox. His, like, classmates. Um, But his writings have endured and theirs haven't. You know, it's one of of those things... Um, 
just brilliant, was known to be dictating multiple works at once to various secretaries. You know, after, shortly after he died, his monastic brothers are telling stories about him hovering off the ground while he's in prayer, you know, which once again may or may not be true, but it shows the regard they had for him, you know, how they thought of his spiritual life. This is not just a big intellect. It's someone whose life is truly devoted. And in a history of Christianity where you can often say, well, this person did this good, but they also did this you know, sketchy thing or this questionable thing, <laughs> Aquinas is one of those who's like, he doesn't have any of that no scandal associated uh, with him. So I, I really enjoy studying Thomas Aquinas. And even though he is considered to be, like his theology was placed, his Summa Theologia, which is his main theological textbook, was placed on the altar next to the Bible at the Council of Trent. Council of Trent happens in the 1500s. It's a Catholic response to the Reformation. And they say Thomas's theology is our doctrine, like our church doctrine. Now, as Protestants, that might make us think, oh, then we should stay away from it, right? Because it's like Catholic doctrine. No, no, don't make that mistake. All right. <laughs> All right. They over-elevated him in that moment, uh, something he wouldn't have done. But there has been, in the last 50 years, a real strong like Protestant appreciation of Thomas Aquinas. So several books have been published that are like Aquinas for Protestants kind of books. You know, um, Many people draw parallels between Aquinas' theology and John Calvin's. You know, they don't know each other. They live three, uh, 300, 400 years apart from each other. Um, but they have many similar theological conclusions. But they're both more mild-mannered folks. To this day, Thomas Aquinas is the patron saint of all universities, all students and teachers. <laughs> so I begin the year at Barry with a prayer of St. Thomas at our convocation, which is just for education. Yeah. All right, I guess that's where we will conclude today. <laughs> Thank you for being here to endure. Yeah, I know some of the Middle Ages period is, doesn't seem as fun, although I'm trying to help it feel fun. Eventually, we will get to the Reformation where there, things will be more recognizable uh, to you. You know more of the, the key figures and such. But go in peace. Love and serve.